Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. It's good to see everybody here in June. Our first meeting since. Yes, yes. Since March of 2020 was the last time we got together. So that's April, May, June. That's uh, 15 months since we've seen each other in person in a meeting. And we get to do it out here in Ionia, so. Hopefully the skies of clear. We'll be actually be able to see some stuff in the sky tonight. So welcome everyone to our June meeting. Um, we have one of our favorite speakers tonight. Let me go through what we're going to see tonight. So here's the agenda. We'll uh, we'll, we'll do a welcome. Uh, we have a bunch of announcements, and then we have our favorite speaker, Dave Bishop. His annual astronomy year interview. He never disappoints. Right before that, it's a big build up, Dave. You got it. <laughs> So, um, is there anybody, this is their first time here? Put your hand up, this is your first time here. Uh, here, yes. Um, so you're, you're a member now. This is the first time you've been here. Is this the first meeting that you've attended for the uh, astronomy section? Yes? Second? It's your first time here? I don't know your name. What's your name? Marilyn? Marilyn? Marilyn. Marilyn. Nice to see you, Mary. And? I'm Chris Elmer. Chris? Okay. Any relation? Uh, no. No? Okay. How'd you hear about us? I've uh, just been in the for a while. I moved here from Cleveland about a year and a half ago. Okay. I was in the club over there. So awesome. Just looking Welcome. To Welcome. Welcome. Hope you enjoy it here. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Um, I thought this was a good cartoon just to put up there. More aperture doesn't mean everything here. You don't have any uh, magnification, I guess. <laughs> uh, any observing recently? Anybody been able to do any observing? Here's a couple of images that Bill Hugh did and Kevin Lyons did in the last few weeks. Anybody be able to get out? Doug? The sun's getting active again. There's some sunspots and some prominences and filaments and last Sunday I saw the green flash. The green, yeah, that's cool. The green flash and the sun's been active. What'd you say, Ken? I say it's sunspot. It's a big time. Yep. Finally got it. What cycles is 25? 25? Finally got it going. If it clears up, we might do a little observing tonight. Um, so uh, just on virtual star parties, I'm going to continue to do those uh, as, long as, uh, as long as there's interest. I just posted the one we did with galaxies with star forming regions, so if you didn't catch it, you can catch that at our uh, our YouTube uh, channel. It's on there. There's two ways to see it. There's uh, we have a meeting where we we review it. And there's a little conversation before the meeting and after the meeting, and that's recorded. And then there's the YouTube video. And the way it's done, uh, when I record it, it, doesn't record the YouTube video. It's something I'm doing, I'm sure. But the YouTube video is the actual star show, but the, the presentation is our, our little meeting to present the YouTube video. So if you go to the YouTube page, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward YouTube channel, uh, what's there. Um, so stay tuned for the next event. We're going to find something interesting to do for the next virtual star party. And that's our YouTube page. Uh, if, you, if you type in astronomy section, Rochester Academy of Science, it's a lot to type in, but even ASRAS, A-S-R-A-S, will get you to our YouTube page. And there's uh, eight virtual star parties and their premieres there. And then our last 14 meetings are on there. And Dave and I just found on Wednesday an old talk that we actually recorded here. I believe it was 1993. You were the host of the meeting. Right. 93. Was it 93? That was five years before he took over. 10 years before. 2003, maybe? Good, good 2003. Where uh, uh, Chuck Spielhoff did a talk. Chuck Spielhoff. On the lunar orbiter, and it was a really good talk. I started, I got a little bit through it. I got to, I got to work with it a little bit because some of the the audio is a little messed up. But I'll put that on this channel, and I think it's a great place to put that. I got to nail down the date, so you can, you guys can figure out what the actual date was. Actually, I have a spreadsheet on that computer okay. with every speaker from 1985 on. That works. Should be in it. Should be know what you think that was. Hey, how long have you been a program? I've been program director for a quarter century. <laughs> he does a good job. What, what, what are you about? <laughs> you should be proud of that. 
Yes, but that, that was my one requirement I took over for me is that you did birth count. All right, let's talk a little bit about our library, which is just outside, past that door on the right-hand side. And in the back, there's a whole bunch of books back there. So, John, did you want to say a few words about the library? There's a, a, there's a catalog that you can see there on this at library thing, and you can um, pick up the book. Go ahead. I'm the librarian. Uh, the books have all been categorized, or cataloged, rather, in Library of Congress sequence. And um, with labels on them, and so um, you can browse the library while you're here, if you want. Or if you go to, uh, uh, we, uh, we're using a uh, software called Library Thing, which is free, that allows us to catalog. And so uh, if you go to https colon forward slash forward slash uh, the, the www.library.com slash catalog slash ASRAS. You can browse our catalog from home. And if you see any books in there that you're interested in, next time you're here, you can go in and uh, self -check, uh, check yourself out. I also want to mention that we have an enormous number of duplicates that um, we don't need. And they're here, they're free. So there's some, even some novels in there. For example, Marshall is there. And a uh, really neat collection of science fiction called Space, Space, Space is in there somewhere. And so, uh, as well as a lot of other interesting stuff, and some textbooks and so forth. And even, even though these textbooks are uh, not the current edition, my experience with textbooks is they change one thing on one page and make a new edition. So it's, uh, most of the stuff in here is uh, pretty good, even though it may be uh, not the most current edition. I'd also like to offer, if anybody knows about like a little free library in our neighborhood, or some place that's, that's taking donations, like a school or something, take take one and put it, give it to them and so forth. There's a bunch of them in the city, tiny little free libraries. Yeah, oh yeah. They're all over the place. Yeah, if you go to the website, you can find a, a, a list of all of them and so nice. forth. Yeah. Uh, they tend to focus on fiction. Some of these things might be uh, useful. Yeah. So uh, feel free to browse and take. They're all free. We're going to get rid of those at some point in time. Yeah. Um, and, and we meant to get the table back. Yes. <laughs> so go ahead, Frank. What were you going to say? Real quick, we have a couple of new members. There are two very good beginning guys in there. Okay? Bernus. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. Backyard astronomy. Yeah, backyard astronomy. Yeah, there's backyard astronomy and, and uh, night watch. Okay. Which is yeah, just two good ones for people who are just right now. So we'll uh, we'll do this. We'll take a break after after I do the announcements. So take a look. If you find a book that you like, take it with you. Take it <laughs> home, and then we'll get Dave set up to do his talk after at the right after the break. So you take a look at the break. There you go. <laughs> we're, we're not upset to see these go. We really need to get rid of these books. So. All right. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. All right. I have a classified ad. We need a new snack coordinator. Uh, Judy and uh, James have been doing it for years and would like to step down, and so we're looking for someone to fill that role of snack coordinator for us at our meetings. Now, we don't have any snacks at this meeting, but we're also just getting back to this, so we're going to think about how we want to do this if we're okay with sharing food that's out in the open, um, something to consider. What do you guys think about that? Should we do something packaged food, like bags of chips or something? What do you think? What do you think of Ferrari Starbucks? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, little, little of, 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 I don't know. I don't know. That might be a good idea. Yeah, well, we're actually it's getting more. Things, yeah, things are loosening up a little more. Right. But hot food is generally safe. Yeah, them, right. But it's the, the non hot food that we have. So it would have to be All right. So it's something to consider. Of, it's called foam like transmission. The risk of foam Transmission right. in the April release from the CDC is now estimated one in ten thousand indoor spaces 
It's impossible to do it by ingesting it by the right. Okay. You have to breathe with your fan. All right. That's good to know. Go with virus, it won't bother you. Thank you. So, so I wouldn't worry about it so much, but if you've got, if you've got spoons and things, just right. make you feel comfortable. Just the rest of the that makes sense. That makes sense. Thanks, Jim. I'd like to uh, yes. thank you, James, for the amount of time you're and my, time, time and money. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. It's been a tremendous job you guys have done over the years. Thank you very much. Okay. Hope I didn't miss, miss one. Okay, here we go. All right, so we have member observing to, not tomorrow, next Saturday. Uh, right here, uh, if you want to do some observing, we have uh, scopes that are here. You can bring your own scope. We actually have loaner scopes downstairs. You don't need to stay all night to have fun looking at the stars. In fact, nobody really stays all night anymore, but usually until the first clouds roll in. So, <laughs> um, so feel free to come for member observing next Saturday. That's not tomorrow, next Saturday, but certainly any night that's clear here is a member. You can come in and uh, use the facilities for observing, but... Uh, You'll have other members with you next Saturday. Uh, we have a board meeting on uh, Wednesday next week. Um, so if you're interested, let me know. We're, we're going to have that in person right here next Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And we're going to hold it to two hours. For those of you who are board members, we've, been, we've had a couple long meetings of late. And Vicki, you're our new secretary. I didn't put this in there. I forgot to put this in there. Vicki will be our new secretary. Ted found it really, Ted Lechman was our, our secretary, was really busy working with the RAS as bulletin editor and doing other things with the RAS, and he wanted to step back. And Vicki was looking to get re-engaged, so we got her back, so we're glad to have Vicki back on the board as our secretary. So welcome back, Vicki. Thank you. Uh, and an open house next Sunday, that's the day after the, the uh, member observing right here. Uh, the protocols have changed a little bit as far as COVID protocols. Um, if you're vaccinated, you can use any resources you want. And, uh, you don't need to wear a mask. But if you are unvaccinated, we ask that you wear face coverings. Please, if you're unvaccinated, wear face masks. Uh, both bathrooms will be available for use. Just uh, please keep the surfaces clean as you as you come and go with these, using the bathrooms. And then if you use, do keep the surfaces clean, take those wipes and throw them in the garbage can, not the toilet. We were on a septic system here. I don't know when we pumped it out the last time, so I don't really want to do it at any time real soon. So. <laughs> All right. All right, Azraz Ware. So Tony Gollenbeck has done a really amazing job of getting together a, a number of the selections for us for uh, Azraz Ware, whether it's light T-shirts, dark T-shirts, pullover hoodies, zip-up hoodies, fleece, vests, <laughs> Men's, women's, different logos, it's all there, and you only have one more day to get your order to him. Um, he sent a note out today as well. Get your get, how many people have ordered stuff already from Tony? Awesome. Awesome. How many people still need to order stuff from Tony? I paid for it. Awesome. So do that by the end of the end of the day tomorrow, or you're out of the loop because everybody wants their stuff, so he's gonna place our order. You have it in your email. You have it in your email. I, I got a tiny, I got a short, shortened one, but if you go to the email, you emailed the today and again last week, I'll, I'll send a little reminder out tomorrow morning. But uh, this is it. It's the last day. And thank you, Tony, so much. There are, it's like 62. This is just the, uh, just the uh, t-shirt, 62 different colors, so you can't go wrong. Thanks very much. By the way, how many shirts and orders have you got? I have about 20 orders for 50 items so far. Nice. 20 orders for 50 items. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And awesome. I think the more orders, the price goes down. Right. Yes. 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 Yep. Okay. Awesome. Okay. All right. So Thursday morning. We have, an, we have a partial annular solar eclipse at dawn. So the sun will actually be in mid-eclipse, or actually a little past, or about mid-eclipse, as sun rises on Thursday morning. And we're going to provide public, safe, projected viewing 
from three places, Charlotte Pier, uh, Martin, Martin Road in Henrietta, Martin Road Park in Henrietta, and then Hamlin Beach Park. Um, at Charlotte Pier, Bob Birch isn't here tonight, is he? But he'll be up there with a projected setup as well as uh, there's a bunch of people from uh, Western New York astronomers will be there as well. Uh, at Martin Road Park, I'll be there uh, with uh, Craig Kaplan, who's not here. And then at Hamlin Beach Park, Steve Fentress will be there. Steve was going to be with me, but Carol can't make it to <laughs> Hamlin Beach, so Steve's going to go to Hamlin Beach and get set up there. Yes, David. I'll be there Hamlin Beach, awesome. Awesome. You still have to use those special glasses. Yes. Okay. So, so if you need glasses, go to the uh, Rochester Museum of Science Center, and they're there. It's a couple bucks. For those those safe class safety classes, um, at Martin Road Park, I will have someone from the museum there with glasses. If you go to Martin Road Park and you don't have glasses, last minute, uh, Dan Schneiderman, who's leading the Eclipse team there at the Rochester Museum of Science Center, this is kind of the dry run. The big eclipse is the one that's three years from now, so that team is underway putting things together. So Dan and I will be at uh, at Martin Road Park. Uh, I'm going to get there as early as four o'clock in the morning. The day before, I'm going to Henrietta and picking up the key to open the park because the superintendent doesn't want to be there at 4 in the morning to open it up. So, so I'm going to be opening up the park at 4 in the morning. Um, I'll be there that early to get set up. Sunrise is at 531, and it only lasts about an hour. It's a little over an hour, and the moon will slide off the face of the sun after about uh, an hour and seven minutes. So uh, got to get up early to see it. Yes. Yeah, so Martin Road Park does – it's a huge park. It's 80 acres. And so we're going to set up at the southwest corner, looking northeast, so we have the, lo the longest view away. Uh, and you really only have a couple of degrees of trees at the, at the low light of the horizon. It's not too bad. It's not bad at all. It's also a good spot, I'm thinking, when the, uh, if we have a great weather for the eclipse three years hence, 80 acres, you can put a lot of people on 80 acres for the big eclipse in April of 2024. Vicki? What road is that on? It's on Martin Road. It's not available, right? Oh, so yes. Yeah. Mark. Um, are you going to be filming it and putting it on YouTube? Because um, uh, I, I, I would love to go, but I've got a uh, medical procedure there. Uh, yeah. Um, any filming would just be of the crowd doing it. I'm not, not going to be filming the eclipse itself. Well, I'm going to be using that laptop, and Mark just installed some software for recording stuff on it. And what I have is I have an eyepiece projection. Okay. I've got a, a webcam that fits into the eyepiece holder of my telescope. So what I'm going to be doing for this particular eclipse is I'm going to have that laptop sitting here running, viewing whatever I've got coming out of the scope. Okay. All and right. I should be able to record that. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to get to. Yeah, so if you're, if you're planning on this, don't just use your telescope to look at the sun, get a beta filter to cover your scope. Use eclipse glasses to look at it. I mean, you might have a second or two at the beginning where you're not you're not getting a lot of sun coming up, but I would, you definitely want to protect your eyes. Looking at the sun for any length of time is really going to damage your eyes. If it, if it gets bright, look away. Yeah. You're, you're pretty pretty direction. straightforward. Yes. So is, is being in the park clear with the park authorities? Yes. So we've cleared this with the uh, made arrangements with Pam Grunman, the uh, parks recreation director at Henrietta. We're, all, we're squared with all the parks. We've done this in well in hand. Hamlin Beach Park, it's uh, Johnny Dust. Mm -hmm. Yep, they're, they're, they're squared away. Yes? But for visitors, are you going to try to uh, like follow them towards the people that are doing projection viewing? Uh, yeah, so visitors are, are, are yeah, visitors are just there to see the projected viewing. That's how it's being advertised. Dave, you're all with them? Or are you going to direct them? Like, sorry, I can't show you something else. I'm looking through an eyepiece. Yeah, that's, you're pretty much going to have to say that. I, it, okay. We're not going to put up a barricade in front of you. No, <laughs> I just want to know yeah. how Yeah, if you want to do your own private viewing, you could do that, but uh, the public viewing is, is projected. Yeah, right. no, Basically, I'm going to be projecting through my telescope onto a sheet at the end, the end of a right. canopy. So. Hey, Neil. What well, pretty well we were doing last summer was to take some blood wrap along and just stretch it over the eyepiece. Yeah. And just change it between... Viewers, okay. because getting that material in your eyes is the risk. Yes. Yes. Thanks, Jim. Any other questions on the eclipse? Right. You got a view to 57 degrees. You probably see it from your living room or front yard. So. Yeah. That's zero. Yes. What percentage of the 
78 percent. It's pretty big. It's going to be, going to be a crescent sun rising. What's the max? It's going to be. I mean, it was fully covered. It's annual, or so. What is it here? We're not just doing year two again. No, I'm, just, I'm wondering what, what it is in the tower. There's not total. Eighty-five percent. Eighty-five. Yeah, in Montreal. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, coming. Yes. How else when the when the club feels comfortable with it when we can turn back on? They'll start doing star parties. Ken asked when we're gonna be able to do star parties again where we meet at Northampton Park or Mended Ponds Park. We gotta figure out when we can actually do that again. It's it's really a matter of uh, people look through other people's eye pieces and you have to be comfortable with that. Is it a matter of somebody saying, I'm vaccinated, I, can I look through your scope? we got to figure that all out. Who's comfortable with that? Or I'm actually going to be meeting at uh, Martin Road Park, an uh, astronomer from the Cincinnati Observatory, and they've been using uh, Pringles cans that have been cut out and they have a little plastic thing and they, could, they just move them. They have everybody in these, this Pringle can and you can use it for yourself to look through an eyepiece. And then you return it. And they just they just spray it off with Windex, and it goes to the next you know, to the next event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we'll see. We'll see. More to come, Ken. So these are our plans for July. Right now, we have no monthly meeting in July because it would be right on that uh, Independence Day weekend. But we will be doing member observing on the 10th, and then an open house on the 11th. And then we'll have a monthly meeting here on August 4th, which will probably be like a little picnic kind of thing. I, think that's what we're going to do. I was actually thinking maybe a picnic and maybe a bunch of other Chuck's pull offs okay. talks. We'll do that. I'm not going to be here. I'll be out in Arizona. So it'll be, uh, Dave will be running the uh, the uh, August meeting right here. Very sorry. And if anyone wants to go someplace explosive, that's still a big weekend. It's also still a big weekend. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> 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 there won't be any of our subscribers. Uh, Watch the Starfest. Well, you, you like read my mind, Mike. August 27th to 28th. It's the 30-year anniversary. Actually, it's the 30-year anniversary, one year removed for the uh, Starfest. It'll be right here. We're gonna, have a, we're gonna have a regular Starfest. We're gonna go down to the Ionia Fire Hall for dinner and our talk. We're gonna set up the fire hall to have uh, a remote uh, talk by Alex Filipenko of Caltech. Which ought to be an awesome talk. We don't have a subject yet, but I don't care what Alex Olpinko talks about. He's very entertaining, uh, a very entertaining speaker. If you've seen him at all on any, many of the uh, television shows that are out there, so um, shortly you'll see the Rochester Star Fest um, form come out you know, to register for the for the Star Fest. It'll be actually cheaper to register ahead of time versus showing up that day to try to come in by, by five dollars. I think. Um, and Alex Filipenko will be a very popular speaker, so we're thinking that uh, we may be charging people from outside to come in to see Alex Filipenko. We may be charging them to to, to watch that talk. Yes. Uh, okay. All right. But hold the dates. Uh, that's uh, August 27th, 28th. We purposely pushed it out that far because we weren't sure how the virus things were going to be going, so we went as far out as we could possibly go. So we get the most flexibility with our star fest. And we're going to have Frank be cooking his uh, infamous barbecue. Maybe even some door prizes barbecue. We'll see. We'll talk about that. Does anyone like bacon door prizes? Bacon. Oh, yeah. I try, I try to get the people. No, no one bacon. What's something wrong with these people? I'm, I, sorry, I would have taken it. <laughs> all right. Yeah, that's all I have. Any questions for me before we go to break? All right. We'll take a quick break and then we come back. Uh, come back in uh, ten minutes or so ten after eight, and we'll have Dave with his uh, astronomy year review. <laughs> all right. On December second, twenty twenty. There you go. Hang on. A meteorite re-entered the atmosphere between Syracuse and Rochester. 
basically coming from north of Syracuse towards south of Rochester. This woman was mushing through the park. You know the um, Montezuma Wildlife Refuge where the eagle is on the 90? Yep. That's just to the left. The eagle's just to the left of where she's mushing here. And you see that object right there? That's it. Now, once this is over with, because this recording stuff is a little finicky, I'll show you the video of this. But I've got a few really cool videos to show you guys. England isn't a very big country. And England doesn't get a lot of meteor falls like we do in the United States. On February 28th, in Wickham, England, this guy entered, re entered the atmosphere. The first meteorite in England in 20 years. Uppsala, Sweden. This guy came in on November 7th, 2020. So we're continuing to get visitors from outer space here on Earth. Uh, about the size of a football. Not very big. Um, weather. The way this show works, and it was in 1992, a guy who's now long dead by the name of Richard Summer convinced me to start these talks. And I've been doing them ever since. Um, this is an area of Siberia right there called Verkhomkonska. Verkhomkonska is Middle Siberia and it's cold there. On June 12th, 2020, the temperature reached 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It has never, ever been that hot in Siberia. Notice the brown. What this is, is this is a dust storm coming off the Sahara. Yep. Basically, Yeah. California wildfires. Remember the explosion in Beirut? Yeah. Before? Yeah. And after? Hurricane? No. Um, what happened was, is they were storing a giant shipment of nitrogen fertilizer in the same building that they decided to store a giant shipment of fireworks. Oh, no. Why is that a problem? <laughs> what could go wrong? What could go wrong? This thing went off with the force of a nuclear bomb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see no fireworks. <laughs> see that building right there? Take a look at the same building over here. <laughs> All the buildings on that here, including the big hole over, over on the side. Well, another thing to notice is see this ship over here? It's lying on its side over here. The wave knocked it right over. Yeah, do you see that the big plane it took out of here? Yeah. This is uh, Beirut. Oh, yes. Beirut over here. The building's gone. It's under water. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, 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 I, that I never saw. No. One of the buildings is whole. That's the whole idea behind this show is to show you something you probably didn't see. Um, when I parouse the net, I tend to parouse places where other people don't. Don't worry, I'm a good guy. <laughs> this is Hurricane Laura from the ISS. The ISS, by the way, has a feed where they send down images. And our old friend, A68A, he's been in my show for the past three years. And here he is. This is the size of Manhattan. And this is South Georgia Island. It finally starts to break up. And now it's in pieces. Is this... Antarctica? Or this is Antarctica. Antarctica. Okay. And if anybody's interested, National Geographic article. That shows you. Oh, I the wrong one. <laughs> um, National Geographic article for last month 
that shows the iceberg breaking up. And it's the first time I ever saw anything about it in the national media. Where, but, where is it breaking up? South Pole? Or? South Pole. Okay. Just when you thought it was safe to be in the South Pole again, this thing caved off on the other side of Antarctica, off the Ross Ice Sheet. And this is another roughly Manhattan-sized iceberg, which just calved off. So slowly, Antarctica is breaking up. There's a lot of ice cubes. Lick Observatory, August 19th. They almost lost a couple of observatories. If they hadn't had firemen up there working on this thing, they probably would have. Lick Observatory, California. San Jose. Oh, yeah, that, that's the one. All fire all around. <clears throat> yep, fire all around all the observatories. And I was just showing you this video. The primary support cable of Arecibo's central obstruction broke. And when it broke, it landed right through the primary um, the primary reflector. And this is what it looked like after they removed it. And they have now bulldozed the entire thing. Yeah. And it's not going to be replaced. Uh, actually, the one they have in China is bigger. Yeah, but it's passive. Just yeah, this, this one's active. This is radar. This one could actually pick up something the size of a dime at the distance of the moon. Hmm. Now, I've got a video of this that I'll show you afterwards if you didn't catch it at the beginning. Here we have DSN 56, newly commissioned deep space network antenna. And if you've ever been to the website, it's really cool to watch. This is called DSN Live. And this is the deep space network. They show you what the antennas are doing at any one particular time. Like this one's talking to the space station. This one's talking to ACE, which is a solar observatory. Here's another solar observatory down here. This one's talking to Juno. And this one's talking to Mars. So if you look at the stations out here, they're on all parts of the globe. So <coughs> and, you know, the drill will be talking to the space station when it's facing the space station. Then later we'll go to Goldstone. And then later on, they'll go to Camara. You can just watch them, and there's the new antenna right there that isn't fully commissioned yet. Where is Goldstone? Uh, Goldstone is in Virginia, right? Where's Marty? Where's Marty? Marty knows he's been there. <laughs> West Virginia. Rocket launches. We've taken our next step up. Uh, the number of rocket launches that we've had over the past several years, and this is sorted out per a uh, different group that launches them, you'll notice that one group has really gone up. Now, I'll start with the other groups. This is a launch from Vandenberg. Uh, this is an Atlas V launch, and this is a National Reconnaissance Observatory launch, classified payload. This is Dream Chaser. The plan is to get Dream Chaser on top of a Boeing rocket and use it to go back and forth to the space station. This is still a pipe dream, but it's entirely possible. When they built Dream Chaser, it was originally going to be used as an emergency escape craft for the International Space Station. But when they designed it to land, they also designed it to be able to take off, too. Goldstone's in the Mojave Desert of California. California, sorry. My bad. Um, this is Virgin Orbits, Launcher 1, and this is their first successful uh, orbital launch. Uh, Virgin Orbit and Virgin Galactic are still going on doing commercial space launches. In fact, just last week, Virgin Galactic had another passenger launch. 
Here we have SpaceX SN9. Blew up upon landing. This is SN10. Landed perfectly, then blew up. And I was speaking before the, the meeting on this. Uh, Starship is a really cool concept, and I'll show you a little bit about that later. This is 15. 15 took off and landed perfectly. July 20th, this is a Falcon 9 launch of a South Korean military satellite. And here we have a composite. A Falcon 9 taking off and a Falcon 9 landing. Same one, actually. This is Crew Dragon 2. And Crew Dragon 2 is a night launch of a Falcon. And what you're seeing is the second stage taking off here, and the first stage actually using its primary engines as a heat shield to slow down. Yes, they use the exhaust from the engines as a heat shield. Here we have the Crew Dragon return module. It almost got washed overboard by a storm after it landed. So what's the name of the barge? Uh, there are three of them now. I know, and their names are great. There's the Yes, I Still Love You in the Atlantic. There's the Yes, I Still Love You 2 in the Pacific. And there's, oh, you remember the name of the third one? No, I don't. Do you remember Yes, I Still Love You? Um, it's something like, what are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Here is Crew Dragon landing for the first time. And what we have here is what SpaceX Starship is going to eventually look like. Okay? Now see the booster here. The booster works just like the Falcon Heavy booster. Okay? It's got these little wings right here. And the little wings allow it to re-enter and land back on the landing pad. Starship sits on top of it. So the thing they've been testing up to 10, 12 hours and back is the capsule that that launches. Yes. Just read the instructions. <laughs> that was the name of it. Just read the instructions. Yes. I'm sorry, that was the name of the barge. Yeah. <laughs> Just read the instructions. Our next step up, the International Space Station. This shot marks 20 years in orbit for ISS. It is starting to age. Here we have Dragon 1 crew docked for the first time. And at this particular point, there are two Dragon modules actually dropped, dropped to ISS. There's a Dragon crew and a Dragon cargo. We got hit. Page two. Uh, on May 12th, a piece of space junk hit the International Space Station. The last one, the last strike they had was eight years ago on the solar arrays. And it made this hole in the Canadian solar in the Canadian arm. It didn't affect any of the mechanics inside. So they got off safe there. But it just does reflect the second hit in eight years. Did it come out the other side? Yeah, Let's it went right we'll through. Will they fix that? Or they leave it be? They're just going to leave it be. Maybe some duct tape. <laughs> yeah. Uh, believe it or not, the space station is very well supplied with duct tape. There's actually duct tape that comes up on every single service mission. <laughs> That's funny. Rolls and rolls of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you get a leak, you put it on the inside of the leak. Believe it or not, it works. <laughs> Here we have the new Bishop uh, airlock beside the Bigelow module. I wish. Uh, the Bishop airlock is designed for getting large things into and out of space. So they can take a fairly large satellite stick it into the big little airlock and then get it inside the ISS to play with it 
and then put it back out again. Cool. Actually, fairly good considering the new Russian module, which is about to be launched in a couple of days, did which they, isn't in my show yet. Did they get that up in pieces? Hmm? Did they get that up there in pieces? Uh, the Bigelow? Yeah. Or, sorry, the Bishop Airlock. Yeah. No, the Bishop Airlock works the same way the Bigelow one does. It's a pleo. So it came up inside something, and then they put it outside and blew it up. <laughs> this is what an eclipse looks like from the International Space Station. This is from June 21st. The James Webb Space Telescope, now due for launch on an Ariane 6 on October 31st, 2021. It just got pushed back to November. Not November, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, it just, it just came out like today. It's getting pushed back. Well, they keep on finding little issues with it. Yes, now it's November. So. This is the Roman Space Telescope which used to be called W first. Oh. Trump tried to kill it, and it's due for launch in 2025. You will probably be seeing a lot of this particular telescope because the backup engineer on the server electronics is me. <laughs> I'm the backup. I'm not the primary. I just have to review the thing after the main engineer does it and make sure that you didn't screw up. You spool half job. <laughs> okay. Our next step out here, this is 2020 SO, a temporary new moon. It turns out that what this actually is, is this is Lunar Surveyor's booster rocket. Lunar Surveyor's booster rocket was shot way outside lunar orbit. It's been wandering around in the outer solar system, and we slowly grabbed it and came back into orbit for one or two orbits, and then flew back out again. So space link. <clears throat> space link. You know what this is? See these little fans down here? These things are designed to prevent reflectivity from the bottom of the spacecraft. The problem with space link is the number of them. They're deployed by SpaceX 60 at a time. There are 1,578 of them up there and active now, and there are 12,000 of them approved for up to possibly 30,000. What's the benefit of them? The idea is uh, internet anywhere. Right now, if you were to live, my parents live in the Adirondacks, and it turns out that they're just within the beta range of SpaceX, um, Starlink. And what you get is you get an antenna about this big. You take it and you stick it on the top of your house and put it up. And you get high-speed internet basically 24-7 from these Starlink satellites. Just about anywhere in the world. Anywhere on the planet. That's got to cost a little bit. So why do you need so many? Now, is that like... Um, is it affected by weather and stuff? So no, it's, it's... So, um, I looked at things <clears> over here because our internet stinks here. And uh, a beta system, you have to pay for the uh, base, which is about $490. And then the uh, the monthly fee is $115 a month. Yeah. So I see yeah. here. So it's not cheap. Yeah. Yeah, I guess if you really wanted internet in a place you normally can't get it. Yeah, it would be really cool to have that. Yeah. I go anywhere in the United States and get my GPS inside. Why can't I get transmission the same way? So I only need one or two satellites instead of The GPS receiver is a line of sight receiver. And what happens yeah. is, is you get one radio signal from the GPS, and it's a slow one. And what happens is, is your GPS, it gets two signals, and those two signals are digital signals that come in, and it actually does a Doppler between the two of them, and that's how it figures out where you are. Okay? 
it triangulates where you are on the surface of the Earth. And it can do that now to within a couple of meters. What we're talking about here is something far more powerful. Okay? We're talking about high-speed Internet. We're not talking about one silly little uh, uh, signal. FM signal coming in. We're talking a huge stream of them and coming in simultaneously from all different directions. Because well, these... <laughs> How far away would you be? <clears throat> uh, these guys are in low Earth orbit. They're about 150 miles up. Call it 210 kilometers. Yeah. Um, the idea is, is they've got so many of them up there. The reason why the beta is so far north is because when they orbit, they've got to linger at the northern altitudes before they can come back into the southern altitudes. So the density at the northern altitudes is better than at the southern altitudes because of the way the orbit works. Are they all going to deorbit or they'll slowly degrade, deorbit uh, one at a time or 60 at a time someday? One doesn't know. They've already lost a couple of them. Um, but one thing that I can tell you is the Russians have come up with another thing called OneWeb. And OneWeb has already launched 200 of them, which is a competing to this guy. And they're planning on doing the same thing with thousands of these things. <coughs> yes, so the days of taking pictures of an hour exposure may be over. They had a real nice sky until things of geostationary satellites for on 42. That's not as fun. Yes. Rob Kremmer and I were here. Oh, about a month ago, we were looking. At, we watched one group of about 60 satellites going by towards the south. We thought it was over, and he was looking through the telescope again to look at a cluster. And another group went right through the cluster. <coughs> um, after the show, I'll, I'll show you a deployment sequence. Uh, SpaceX has a really cool deployment sequence where they launch a complete fleet of these things. Is there a big time delay for the signal to go from Earth up and back? No, actually, it's fairly quick. Yes? Does this have something to do with, um, remember the CubeSats? CubeSats. Like CubeSats are still a thing. Uh, so CubeSats, the... I thought, wait, I thought, like, the, Cube, I thought the, the Starlink, the Starlink was, like, um, associated with them. No. Um, Starlink is completely different thing. The Starlink satellites are about that big. Right, that big. Okay. So if they degrade, they'll probably just burn up again. So yeah. I mean, that's not going to be an issue. They're, they're actually built like a plate. You've ever seen a blade server? They look they look like two blade servers sitting side by side with a big antenna on the top. A blade server? <clears throat> a, a blade server is the kind of computer that you put in a rack. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. I had a question. Is there any possible future that NASA or our space agency will go up to the space, destroy a couple of uh, debris in space? Uh, there you actually know, is some. Um, that was actually in last year's talk, <laughs> was a space degree mitigation thing that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And they actually have a. Um, it's not in this presentation. It'll probably be in next year's presentation where they're going to launch it. But the Planetary Society is actually working on this too. The way it works is it goes up and it's got a little grab claw. And it reaches out and it grabs the satellite. And then it slows down and it lets go of the satellite. And then it speeds up again to go after the next one. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> And that's how it works. Yes? Wasn't SpaceX going to be um, developing a, um, a space fence to, uh, um, as like a shield for all the space junk that's out there? Because uh, um, a company that I used to uh, work for um, used to supply parts for, uh, for the space fence. So, uh, Actually, I've never heard of that one. I'd have to look that one up. <clears throat> but this is a very busy slide. This is from January 1st, 2021. And unfortunately, it's the newest one that I can find. Okay? Do I have to go through my Lagrange point talk? Do we know what a Lagrange point is? 
Okay, I'll assume everybody does. Out at L1, between the Earth and the Sun, we've got four different satellites orbiting that point. They're actually doing figure eights through the Lagrange point between the Earth and the Sun. Off out at the moon, we've got the geoprobe off at Lagrange 2, which is Earth-Sun Lagrange 2, not Earth-Moon Lagrange 2. And I'm actually getting data every day from the geoprobe. It's really cool. Its primary mirror is shaped like a parabolic TV set. It's the same high-definition TV set aspect ratio curved into a parabola. <laughs> One, one and a half meters by a half a meter. And that's what he uses. It's scanning for asteroids, and it also scans for supernova. And every morning they send me the report. Okay? Well, yeah, what the guy is really doing, you know, the straw. It's measuring star positions. It's measuring star positions, yes. That's what it's really doing. Yes. New stars. Okay. So out at the moon... Things are busy at the moon. We've got Chiang 3 on the front of the moon, Chiang 4 on the back of the moon. This Quaquo thing right here is a relay satellite, and he's orbiting the Earth-Moon L2 position behind the moon. And he's orbiting it so far out that he's actually looking over the top of the moon. There's actually a five-degree separation between the orbit of the moon and where this thing is so that it can relay data from the back of the moon, from the Chinese lander. Uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter is still up there. The Artemis probes are sitting beside the moon, and they're doing gravity waves. They're doing um, lunar gravity mapping. And this is Chandrayaka-2, which is an India probe, which is currently in orbit around the moon. I'll talk to you about its lander later. And look at the big mess we've got over at Mars here. <laughs> okay? When this was done, these three probes were on the way. There was Tiawan 1, which is the Chinese probe with the lander, Perseverance, and Hope. They are now in orbit around Mars with all the rest of these guys, including the Mars InSight lander, and the Curiosity Lander. <coughs> now going out further, we still have the Juno probe in orbit around Saturn, and we're still in communication with Voyager 1 and 2 and New Horizons. This is the landing site of the Vikram Lander. This is India's lander, and unfortunately, it landed in little bitty pieces. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> the Chiang 4 rover is on the back of the moon, and it's on its 27th lunar day, driving around the back of the moon. And it's currently 1.8 kilometers from its landing site. Tell me that's not a mile marker. I know. <laughs> I mean, it looks like an erosion feature. Right? It's a mile marker. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> it just happened to be exactly one mile from the rover or from the lander. It might be. The, the little thing sticking up is. I, I know you've seen them. You drive by them all the time. They're mile markers sitting beside the road. And it's just the right size, the right height. <laughs> okay, here we have the Chinese Chiang 5 lander. It landed on the moon on December 2nd. 
And there is it landing on the moon. It grabbed a sample, put the sample into the return module, and here's the return module taking off, as seen from the landing module. It docked to its probe up in space and landed in China. So for the first time in 60 years, or 40 years, sorry, we have fresh lunar samples. Yeah. How did they land? Like, what type of water? They landed it in China. Yeah. It's a parachute. It's a reentry module. It didn't land in Wuhan, did it? <laughs> I don't have where it landed, but I have a link to the article and we can find out. It didn't land in Wuhan. I know. I'm being facetious. You answered it. Parker Solar Probe. Getting in close to the sun now. And it's finding these little bitty solar flares. They're called campfires. They may be a little bitty on the surface of the sun, but you see the scale of the Earth here. That thing's actually the size of California. Parker is being joined by this guy, which is a European solar probe. This one doesn't have any cameras, and it's designed to observe the solar wind. Here we have a shot from Bipepi Combo. On its way in towards Mercury, it made a swing by Venus. And there's Venus in the background. This is Venus from the Akasuki probe. Uh, hmm? Bipepi Combo. It's actually three different spacecraft. It's by Pepe and Combo, and another spacecraft, which is actually the booster rocket, which is getting it there. What was the name of that one? I don't remember. By Pepe Combo is two different solar is two different probes. One probe was built by the European Space Agency. The other one was built by Japan. And the booster rocket was built in the United States. <clears throat> what this is, is this is a phosphine map of Venus. Uh, taken from the Akazuki probe. Phosphine is a biomarker. Biological processes on Venus. Check this guy out. I just had to put this up here. Usually I don't do the way in the future concept probes. This is a Venus lander. The idea is that they can't build electronics that can survive on Venus. So they're going to do the whole thing mechanically. It's going to have a fan up there, and the fan's going to rotate, and it's going to run a train chain drive, and the chain drive is going to run everything inside the rover. And deep inside the rover is going to be a little teeny tiny computer, which is going to be super cool so that it can still survive, hopefully for months. And the way it works is it's all fiber optic communication <coughs> down to the computer because the fiber optics, fiber optics can survive in that temperature. Purely mechanical. No electronics at all, except for the core. Uh, super high pressure, but they don't care. The wonderful thing about the pressure is, is the wind is always moving. And that's why they can do this with nothing but a fan sitting up there. It's just catching the wind, and that just powers everything. No RTG, no other power source than that. They could use solar panels that close to the sun. Can't use solar panels on Venus. Doesn't work. You can't. The atmosphere is so thick. It's 600 degrees 
<clears throat> on the surface of Venus. No, 600 uh, Celsius. It's all purely <laughs> mechanical. The only thing that's got power is going to be the core computer, and the core computer is going to run off of a battery of some sort. Oh, and by the way, has everybody heard about the big breakthrough in batteries that they found two weeks ago? No. They finally got a lithium metal battery to work. Lithium metal. Lithium metal. Not lithium ion, lithium metal. 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 Oh, metal. So, so lithium ion and nickel metal hydride out of beef. Right. And it's, it's the, metal. the cool thing about a pure lithium metal battery is it essentially it the problem with batteries is how efficient they are. Okay? You take your little battery that you've got. And its efficiency is maybe 30% as far as the energy put into it to build it. Lithium, pure lithium metal, they're talking 70 to 80%. How many people here know what a shipstone battery is? Come on, who's read, Robert, who's read the Robert Heinlein? The idea behind a shipstone battery is you forget about this huge infrastructure you've got going to Niagara Falls to get power, or going to the power plant to get power. You've got a battery in your basement. The battery is about the size of your hot water heater. And every year, this guy grew up, drives up in a truck, and he hooks up to it, and he charges it back up again, and then he drives away. And you've got enough power for an entire year in that battery to run your entire house. That's possible with lithium metal. <laughs> All right. Enough going off on tangents here. Mars. As you can see, we've got a lot of activity going on on Mars. And let me speed this up a little bit. I'm sorry, we're 9 o'clock already. We should be done by now. I'll, I'll just zip through the rest of these guys. Um. The Mars InSight mole, they couldn't get it in. They put the shovel on top of it to push it in, and it got down about six inches, and that's it. So they've kind of given up on the mole trying to bury itself deep inside the surface of Mars. It turns out the surface of Mars is a lot harder than we thought it was. It's hollow, right? We wish. <laughs> This is a shot from the Tiwan One Mars probe from China. Yeah. We just saw that. We saw that overhead the other day. The, uh, the Mars. Mars the, sorry, the Chinese, Chinese space station. Yeah. Yeah. I'll talk to you about. I'll talk to you about that next year's show because they just launched the second segment of that. Um. This is the Chinese lander, and this is a concept of it landing, and this is actually a shot from the lander. On the surface of Mars. And since this shot was taken, it's deployed. Here we have the Curiosity rover. And this is the path the Curiosity rover has taken since it landed. This is called Navarro Mountain, Raphael Navarro Mountain, and there's a selfie. Check this out. Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was going over Perseverance's landing site, and there's the chute, and there's Perseverance. Here's the next orbit. There it is, safely landed, and here's a contact shot. There's the back shell, descent stage, and the heat shield. Check out this cable here. That cable turns out to be nothing but a standard network cable. And the cameras up inside the um, up inside the 
uh, landing portion, the portion with the engines on it, reeling it down to the probe. And here we have the first shot from Perseverance. Mm -hmm. The selfie with Perseverance and Ingenuity. It's a little helicopter. Mm -hmm. And the helicopter works perfectly, flying around on Mars. Um, it's done its sixth test flight so far. And it actually lost contact with the main probe. It was able to figure out where it was and come back. Mm -hmm. well, that's great. Stepping our next step out, this is Hibatius 2, the Japanese sample and return mission from asteroid Ryugu re entering the Earth's atmosphere. And there is the sample from asteroid Ryugu. This is asteroid Bino. It turns out that asteroid Bino occasionally drops some gravel off into space. It's actually losing gravel. Of course, it lost some this way. This is the um, OSIRIS-REx probe grabbing a sample off the surface. And it's on its way back to Earth now with its sample. This is going to be launching fairly soon. This is a, a spacecraft called DART. Didymus A and Didymus B are going to do a fairly close approach to Earth. Didymus B is a moon of Didymus A, and what they're going to do is they're going to take this spacecraft and they're going to whack the moon and hopefully perturb its orbit. And the idea here is to figure out a way to deflect asteroids. <coughs> From last year, Comet Neowise. A comet that we couldn't have a star party for. That was great. That that really helped us get through the summer. Yeah, that was kind of cool. I actually sat in one of my neighbor's uh, front yards watching it pretty much all night long and talking. <coughs> Jupiter and Saturn, uh, December 21st, 2020. Jupiter, Hubble Space Telescope shot. Shot from the Juno probe. I've got a really cool Juno movie I can show you later. This is an artist concept of what it's probably like at the very top of the clouds. Those clouds apparently are shedding lightning Could you out show of that them. Jupiter again? Thank you. Yeah. I was going to say, Dave, that your next one is a gray spot that they say just that it just broke up. Yes. What do I have here for that? Yeah, this is just a cloud that just popped up, is what it says here. Yeah, but, but it popped up, it was a nice round cloud, and then it turned into that just recently. Just came out today. <laughs> okay. Okay, back one here. Yes, the lightning. This is a really curious one. The Juno probe <clears throat> was in orbit around Jupiter and it turned around to lock on the Deep Space Network. The Deep Space Network carrier wave is an FM radio signal, and it's basically frequency modulated. It's five different channels. <clears throat> and what it does is it looks for those five channels and locks, and then tries to get the carrier wave to get data. Instead of locking on the Deep Space Network, it picked up the exact FM frequency from Ganymede. The transmission lasted for five seconds. <clears throat> now, the thought is that it's got to be somehow involved with Ganymede's Aurora. I've listened to Aurora and AM before, but FM? With the exact carrier frequency of the Deep Space Network? <laughs> no avos, for you, sir? No avos? <laughs> Every year we get something like this. I mean, last year it was the, or, or year before last, it was the Oumatu coming through. And that rock that was just exactly at the spot where Arthur C. Clarke said the obelisk was buried. <laughs> curiouser and curiouser. Saturn, Hubble Space Telescope shot. 
the ice of Enceladus in new ice. And you see some of the older features too. Notice that the Saturn facing side of Enceladus is the old side. Where'd it go? Hmm. Missing a slide here. All right. Uh, dark spot on Neptune, the new one detected by Hubble. This is from the New Horizons probe. This is Alpha Centauri, and this is Proxima Centauri. And this is Alpha Centauri, and that's Proxima Centauri. It's actually moved far enough away from the sun so that you can actually see the stars move. Parallax. Parallax, yes. Proxima Centauri flared on May 1st, 2019. It did a UV blast that was 100, 100 times more powerful than its normal output of seven seconds. So 100x. So think of the sun, and then 100 times brighter for seven seconds, and then back down. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, it would. Uh, this is 300 light years away. This is actually an exoplanet, actually visibly found by Hubble. This is a context shot. See the yellow dots? Those are high-resolution Hubble Space Telescope fields of view. What they're doing is they're doing an intensive survey map of the Orion Nebula. Here we have Orion's belt, the sword, Betelgeuse, Rigel. Young stars forming in Orion. This is what they're looking for. Almost done. I see 5063. 36,000 light years away. Faint arms, Hubble Space Telescope shot. <clears throat> There's something called a fast radio burst. And these are being detected by the Deep Space Network and radio telescopes. They're chirps. And they start off at a very high frequency, go down to a very low frequency, and then stop. And they're very loud, and they hear these guys quite a bit, but they don't know what's causing them. And it turns out they're extragalactic. They're coming from distant galaxies. And this is my last slide. Dark energy as opposed to matter. Dark matter as opposed to regular matter. And regular matter as opposed to galaxies and stars. Does it matter? <laughs> Does it energy? All right. And that's all I've got for you guys. I apologize for going to the Uh, I've got some videos for you if you'd like to stay a little longer. This, by the way, has been uploaded to the web page. And if you go to this particular URL, oops, sorry about that. If you go to that URL, you will see this presentation and all the videos attached to it. And how many saw the, uh, saw the Arecibo collapse? You want to see it again? Let me uh, record it. Okay. <clears throat> Turn up the volume. Yeah, I can watch it now with my regular glasses. I've been pointing out where I need two sets of glasses.
One for distance and one for unit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually track them. Yep. Okay. They don't work for them. Um, yeah. okay. My focus on Fox is on Fox. Well, I'll be 60 next year. Uh, yeah, I can post a link. I'll post a link in the link. Turn the sound on. Left hand side. Left hand side. and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Applicant in the cage, shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second at an altitude of about 10 km, nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Now because it was coming in so close, they had to actually use Perseverance to guide the landing. So they want to land in a soft spot and not on top of the reef itself. So what Perseverance did is Perseverance had a map in its memory of all these little craters and features. Net filter converge. Velocity solution, 3.3 meters per second. And altitude, 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second. 6.6 kilometers of the surface. And there's that reef that was the Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. So there's the spot it picked. valid. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Priming. TBA is nominal. 
we have timing of the landing engines. Back shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain and altitude navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. All right. Pretty cool. One more, if you don't mind. Not at all. Which one? I'm thinking the Jupiter Juno. It's five minutes. Okay. What you want to use?
side after that. I click on that. And this goes to the Syracuse.com. I'll scroll down. There's the path. Scroll down. And you'll see video somewhere. Nope, you passed it. Captured on video. Okay, bye bye. Oh, I hope I got that. I just saw a comment. Or a Holy cow, I think that was a shooting star, but in the day. Or, or a bomb. <laughs> I hope I got that. Okay, bye bye. What was Roger? Oh, I hope I got that. I just saw a comment. Or a Holy cow, I think that was a shooting star, but in the day. Or, or a bomb. <laughs> I hope I got that. Pretty cool. All right. All right. Um, let's see. There was the video I wanted to go to. Just, just go back. Yeah. Oh, go to the first one. Yeah. And then go back. We're gonna go down to the bottom again. Um. There's a margin gene. I already showed you the space that's what, Oh, launch ISS from orbit. It's only one minute long. And we'll call it the How's that nice? How long is this one? One minute. Okay. Let's start at the beginning. Oh, a rocket launch from Earth is in space. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. It's hot in here. Thanks, David. Thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for coming to the June meeting. We'll do this again later in the summer.
Have a great night. I don't know if it's clear out or not. We can get you some observing.